Well, good afternoon. Welcome to the Museum of the Abermiles History from, for Lunch from Home. We are delighted that we have Dr. Matthew Bertone from North Carolina State University. He's the entomologist, Director Entomologist of Plant Disease and Insect Clinic at NC State. Um, he's, like I said, he's going to be coming to us today from Raleigh. So just a few housekeeping rules. If you will mute your, make sure you're muted, which you should be. Um, it's sometimes easier to turn your video off if it is on, which the video should be off. And if you have any questions, we will take your questions through the bottom of the screen. There's a Q&A that you can click on. You can type your question and we will look at the questions at the end of the talk today. And I see we have one chat and oh, we have the Benjamin House with us today. The Benjamin House is a um, local home. They have about I think about 10 residents and they're always here for our history for lunches when we're in person here at the museum. Um, the museum, we're still not open yet, so we hope to welcome our visitors back in July. Um, it, of course, everything, all of your welcome back to, into the museum will be based upon Governor Cooper's decision um, that should be coming out on June the 26th. So hopefully we can move forward, but we will um, we will follow Dr. I mean Governor Cooper's rules in opening the museum. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Bertone today, and I'm going to let him begin his talk on the Asian hornets. Great, thank you, thank you for inviting me. Uh, Okay, I hope you can see all that. And uh, well, thank you. Um, I uh, today I'm going to be talking about a current topic, of course, uh, and try to dispel some of the myths and try to inform you about uh, these these wasps. Uh, so today I'm going to be talking about the truth about Asian giant hornets. Um, and uh, my talk is going to be broken up into a few parts. Uh, so what are wasps and hornets? Uh, what is the Asian giant hornet specifically? Uh, why are people talking about them now? And uh, what do you need to know, uh, including the risks and the, some lookalikes? Uh, because we do have a fair number of native wasps or at least wasps that have been here for a long time that may be confused for them. Um, so, what are wasps? Okay, well wasps is kind of a general term uh, for insects in the order Hymenoptera. So the order Hymenoptera actually has over 150,000 species in the world uh, and probably many, many more than that. Uh, well, definitely more than that and probably maybe, you know, several hundred thousand species. Um, and Hymenoptera contains the sawflies, bees, ants, and wasps. And wasp is really just a generic term. Um, so sawflies, uh, you can see one up here, there's a wood wasp called a, a type of sawfly. Sawflies are primitive wasps whose larvae feed on plants. Many of them are caterpillar-like and feed on foliage, um, and they don't sting. They don't have venom, they can't sting, they lay their eggs in plants or on plants or in wood and they feed on that. And that was the earliest wasps. Uh, then most of the diversity in wasps are actually uh, parasitoids, which means they're parasites that kill their host. And these hosts are insects or spiders. Uh, and these also can't sting humans. So here's an example. This is a calcitid wasp that had emerged from this, uh, this caterpillar on an oak leaf. Um, and so the, the largest diversity of wasps are what we call parasitoid wasps. And many of them are very small to microscopic. Some of them are smaller than single celled organisms, which is pretty amazing to me. Um, so that's wasps in general, uh, but stinging wasps are a whole big group of wasps that have uh, evolved a stinger from their egg laying device. So the egg laying device is what's called an ovipositor. 
and a group of these wasps had developed a venom gland associated with this ovipositor. And the primary use of this is to kill or paralyze prey for their young. Here is a potter wasp. It's actually a close relative of uh, the wasps we'll be talking about today, the hornets and paper wasps. Uh, but these are solitary and they hunt caterpillars and they sting the caterpillars, uh, paralyze them and feed them, put them in a pot, a mud pot for their young to feed on. Um, since they don't have refrigerators, they have to paralyze the prey so it doesn't rot uh, and stays fresh, but doesn't leave the nest. But because venom can be painful and powerful, it's also used for defense. So if something tries to eat one of these wasps or grabs it, they will sting in defense and the venom can be painful. And now venoms, wasp venoms vary in chemical composition and the resulting painfulness or toxicity. Uh, for instance, some venoms are toxic, but not as painful, whereas others are more painful, but not as toxic. Uh, and actually, uh, Justin Schmidt, who is a bee researcher long ago, who, well, he, he's still alive, but he uh, he's, was researching bees, but he also wanted to know more about uh, stinging wasps and why their defense, why their venoms uh, are painful. And so he actually developed the Schmidt pain index where he stung himself with numerous types of wasps to tell how painful they were so that he could figure out what evolutionary advantage that was. Uh, it's a very famous, well-known uh, index um, and very interesting, actually. People think he's kind of crazy, but he's actually fairly normal. He just used that for uh, research. Okay, so stinging wasps are a group, again, using their sting mostly for prey capture, but also for defense. Um, now, one interesting thing I should note, so when you think of the most venomous creatures in North Carolina, most people might think it's either a snake, not necessarily a copperhead, but maybe a water moccasin or a rattlesnake or a black widow, perhaps, because everybody hears of terrifying things like black widows, but actually, the most venomous animal in North Carolina is a type of wasp, technically, an ant, the harvester ant. Uh, by volume, it has the most toxic venom in North Carolina. Uh, of course, they don't inject a lot, so a snake is gonna be more dangerous uh, by individual bite or sting, but technically, if you injected the same amount of venom, a harvester ant venom is much more potent than a rattlesnake or a black widow. So that's just an aside about stinging wasps. Now, among the stings, several group of, groups of social wasps. So uh, most stinging wasps are solitary. They hunt other insects or spiders. Um, and uh, they, uh, they don't live in colonies. They don't defend colonies. They basically live alone. But several groups are what we call eusocial. That means they form colonies with a division of labor, brood care, and overlapping generations. Uh, so the most famous social wasps are ants, which of which all ants are social. Uh, some bees, uh, not all bees, most bees are actually solitary uh, that we have in the state. And some wasps are eusocial. So today I'm going to really focus on this family Vespidae. Uh, that contains several types of social wasps. Now that potter wasp I showed that was catching the caterpillar is also a Vespid and it's one of the solitary ones but a large portion of the wasps, the, the, the social wasps you'll be seeing out there uh, in this family um, are, well, a lot, a lot of the uh, social wasps you'll see out there are in this family. And many of them will be familiar to you. And I hope to highlight, of course, the one that everybody is talking about now. Okay, so Vespid wasps build nests out of paper from pulp they collected off wood. So if you ever see a wasp, like a hornet or a yellow jacket or a paper wasp uh, scraping wood from an old fence or some old trees. Uh, they are basically mixing that with saliva and making a pulp ball to build their paper nests from. Uh, the adults will each uh, feed on sugary liquids for energy, um, such as nectar, honeydew, sap. Uh, they can't actually eat solids. But when you do see them feeding on solids or grabbing solids like uh, soft-bodied prey or other things, they're actually taking that back to the nest to feed their young, the larvae in those paper cells. Um, 
you can see this one actually here. This is a yellow jacket that's actually feeding on some meat at a picnic from a piece of chicken. So they will grab different bits of protein for their young to feed on. The young actually have mouths that can feed on solid foods, um, whereas the adults cannot do so. So uh, one thing I want to note, so Vespid wasps can be characterized by two, uh, in two ways. They're, they're fairly easy to identify. Firstly, their wings are usually at rest are folded lengthwise. So you can see how it's like a thin looking wing here. They also have this notch in their eye. And these are going to be important for when we talk about the lookalikes later on. But Vespid wasps are going to have this general look, although they come in different colors and shapes. So uh, the first most common one, group that you probably all know about and have seen are the paper wasps. These are in the genus Polistes, and they have small open nests in protected areas. We most often see them up in the eaves of houses or in tree holes, places like that. This is a tropical uh, member of the group where they're nesting on a leaf, uh, but they can nest all different places that are usually protected um, and they start off with a, you know, one female or a couple and they create this paper colony. You can see the eggs actually in the cell that are going to uh, turn into larvae and then they're going to be fed by the adults. The adults again are, are feeding on uh, uh, liquids and bringing their prey back to the young. So paper wasps are very common. Uh, they usually have fairly small uh, colonies, only uh, about a dozen individuals or less. Uh, although actually the largest nests in this, this group of wasps is a species in South America that can have up to a million members in the colony. And they're, they're huge, huge colonies. But around here, they're typically the smaller, smallest nests of all these types of wasps. And they're usually not aggressive. Uh, they only have a few individuals to, to defend and they may fly around, uh, stare you down, but they're really not going to come out and sting you uh, like some of the other wasps might. Uh, yellow jackets are typically are members of the genus Vespula, and these typically nest in ground in the ground or in logs. Um, they are the small. They are some of the smaller ones. Um, now I should note the yellow jacket is typically used for any of these black and yellow Vespid wasps, but uh, you'll I'll note on the next slide that there are some differences in the behavior and where they nest depending on the type. Uh, so here's actually a really good way you can see this notch in the eye and these folded wings that show that it's a Vespid wasp. So yellow jackets, again, uh, there are many more individuals in the nests um, than paper wasps. Again, they're in the ground. I've actually been stung by them a couple of times when running over them in the lawnmower. Um, they get agitated, of course. They come to protect the colony. Uh, out and about, they're not going to sting you. And this is actually a theme that, that you should remember is that when the wasps are alone, they, they're not going to be aggressive. When you get very close to their nest, that's when they want to protect it. And because yellow jackets usually have many hundreds of specimens of, of individuals in the, in the nest, they will sacrifice some to protect the colony. And so they can be aggressive when you get near. Um, but otherwise, if they can be left alone, they're, they're not harmful. They're actually even good pest control because they often hunt caterpillars and other soft body pests of plants. Then we have some other native hornets or yellow jackets. Now this genus Dolicovespula have much larger individuals typically, and they also typically have aerial nests, which means they create these paper nests in, the, in trees and up high. Uh, I should note that yellow jackets, even though they're in the ground, they actually still do create a paper nest inside the ground. Uh, you just can't see it. So one of the more common ones is the bald-faced hornet. It's a fairly large hornet. Um, it's black with very pale, almost white markings on it. Uh, the abdomen is almost all black, except for the tip of the abdomen will have some markings. But there are yellow and black uh, Dolica vespula, and such as this aerial yellow jacket. Um, and if you want to see what the nests look like, here's a picture. Um, it was taken of a bald-faced hornet nest and their large football shaped nests uh, in, inside this nest, uh, the paper carton will be uh, uh, 
basically levels of different uh, uh, paper uh, discs that have cells that, where they create the new young. So here's the hole that they come in and out of. And again, they're usually created up high in trees exposed out, out in the open. Lastly, uh, we have one species of Vespa that is established in the US and it has been here for over 180 years. Um, it was brought into the US in the 1840s. Uh, from what I read, it may have been brought in to help control forest pests. And back then we didn't think much about invasive species and their causes, uh, the issues they cause the environment. But the European hornet, whoop, Vespa crabro, uh, nests in trees and buildings. Usually it makes a paper nest inside of tree cavities, but there are cases where they make uh, paper nests in eaves and in attics of people's homes. Uh, and these are very large wasps, uh, well over an inch long to uh, two inches long. And I'm going to talk more about these later because uh, they're very close similarity to Asian giant hornet. And if you've ever seen a cicada, this is going to show you how big those wasps are. Uh, and like I said, these wasps are predators for their young. So this, this large hornet took down the cicada and basically uh, broke open its thorax and chewed out some meat to feed its young and it left the carcass there. So uh, again, if you've ever seen a cicada, one of our native uh, annual cicadas, you know how big they are. You can tell how big this wasp is. Okay, so now about the murder hornet. And actually I should pull back. Murder hornet is not the name we use for this wasp, but unfortunately, when news broke about it, a lot of the media latched on to this name, murder hornet, um, unfortunately. Uh, and so I just wanna tell you that, that although it can be useful now to search for information about it, we really don't uh, recognize murder hornet as a name for this wasp. Uh, really, uh, we call it the Asian giant hornet in, uh, in Asia, in Japan, they call it a sparrow wasp because it's so large. Um, in China, they can call it the ox killing wasp because its sting is so painful. Uh, but basically, Asian giant hornet or the scientific name Vespa mandarinia is preferred. Um, and this is what uh, the Asian giant hornet looks like. So um, as the name implies, Asian giant hornets are native to Asia. Uh, Eastern, South, Eastern and Southeastern Asia is where you can find them. Uh, there are some members in Russia, East Russia, and Japan has them. Uh, and this is where they're native to. Um, incidentally, the European hornet, although called that, is found all across Europe and Asia. So there are some places where, in fact, the Asian giant hornet and European hornet overlap in the native range. So the Asian giant hornet is the largest hornet in the world. Uh, workers are about an inch and a half long and queens are up to two and a quarter inches long, which is very large for an insect, let alone a hornet and a stinging insect. Um, the head is entirely yellow and with very small eyes relative to the head. This is gonna be important later on in distinguishing uh, this from other similar lookalikes. But as you can see, the, the cheeks this part of the head, uh, the cheeks in this wasp are very wide compared to the eyes. Uh, again, another characteristic. They also have a very dark thorax and abdomen, their abdomen with thick black stripes uh, that are very uniform. Now, Asian giant hornets uh, prefer to nest underground in existing cavities, especially rodent burrows, uh, rotten, rotted out uh, stumps, areas like that. Uh, in fact, in the native range of the many thousands of nests people have seen, they very rarely uh, nest above, above six feet above the ground, and most of them are going to be underground, which is a bit different than, other, than the European hornet, which likes to nest up in trees, cavities, and up high in structures. Now, queens start nests in the spring after winter hibernation. Uh, this is actually uh, the same thing for all vespid wasps, where a queen will overwinter. In fact, in the U.S., 
uh, native vespid wasps like paper wasps will sometimes overwinter or hibernate in homes, in attics. And so in the fall, in the spring, people see them either coming in or leaving uh, at these hibernation sites. So the queen starts to nest in the spring after the winter hibernation. Uh, she's already been mated. Uh, and when the colony reaches a critical size, workers do all the work. So first she's out collecting the paper, the pulp for the, for the nest. She's laying eggs. She's catching prey. Uh, but once it reaches, reaches a certain size, she never leaves the nest again and all her workers do everything else. Uh, the colonies can have hundreds of wasps in them when they're full grown. Uh, they can have several hundred to a thousand cells in the nest, uh, but the cells are not always being occupied and can be reused. And the workers don't live very long. They only live about a couple weeks. Now near the end of the season, the nests begin producing queens and males. They feed them more food. They have special cells for them. They're a bit larger than the workers. And what happens is then the males are produced first and they leave and they wait outside the nests of other uh, hornets and wait for queens to come out. When they mate, they die. The mated queens then uh, go and hibernate. Then later in the year, in the fall, or uh, early winter, uh, basically the entire colony dies out except for that mated queen that's gonna hibernate. And again, this is, this is basically the same for uh, our paper wasps and our other hornets that we have locally. So what do they eat? Well, it's very similar to uh, European hornets and other local hornets. So workers will feed on fermenting sap, slime flux, and uh, tree wounds. They rarely go to flowers, um, but they're, they're mostly associated with tree sap. Um, now the solitary workers will hunt various other insects for their meat, just like that cicada picture, except for here, there's, it looks like a mantis, I think, a praying mantis is being eaten. Um, and they use this again to feed their young. Now, one of the most uh, important and difficult or very interesting factors in the Asian giant hornet is that they have a stage called the slaughter and uh, occupation phase. This is late in the season when the colonies are at their biggest, they have, uh, they're feeding a lot of larval mouths. And what happens is numerous workers will coordinate attacks on colonies of wasps and bees. So one worker will find a colony of some other hornet or some bee and they will mark the area to let other hornets know, their other colony mates know that this is a good source of food. And what happens is they go in there, they kill all the adults and then take all the larvae of that wasp for their own. And so what happens is that uh, beehives can actually be severely affected. So um, they'll occupy the beehive, they'll decapitate and kill most of the bees or all the bee adults in there, and then start basically capturing all the larvae of that, those bees and feeding them to the larvae of the hornets. Uh, and this is really um, a pretty crazy phenomenon, but uh, actually in some areas, especially uh, in Japan, the Asian honeybees there, different species than our own honeybee here, uh, which is also not native to the US, but a different species than our European honeybee, the Asian honeybee, uh, some of them in Japan uh, actually have a behavior where they uh, collectively uh, surround a hornet individual, which are much larger than them, and I'll show you in a few minutes, um, and they beat their, they basically heat up their muscles and cook the wasp. Uh, they also increase the CO2 and basically kill the wasp by cooking it and suffocating it in this ball of bees, which is great, but unfortunately our bees don't do that here. And so I'll talk about that in a minute, about the dangers to, of this hornet to our, our, our local honeybees. Okay, now, of course, uh, another thing people are worried about with the name murder hornet is whether they're, how dangerous they actually are. Um, so really, they should be treated as any other hornet or stinging wasp. So as with all hornets and social wasps, unlikely to, they're unlikely to sting unless defending their nest. They are not particularly aggressive. They are not, if they are out and about, they would not sting you just out of, the, out of for no reason. 
they have to be threatened or you have to get near their nest. Now, Asian giant hornet has a very large stinger and injects large quantities of venom, which is the problem with this species. It's a very large wasp, so again, it, it, has a, it packs a punch. The venom, though, is not actually that potent compared to some. It's even less toxic than bee venom, which is interesting, and even less toxic than some of our native hornets. But it can be very painful. Uh, really what happens with the, the issues and the dangers with stings in general from wasps is that it's the number of stings and also allergic reactions that can be the most important uh, factors when dealing with human health. So people that are allergic to venoms, uh, which different venoms can you can be allergic to, but if you're allergic to a certain venom, that obviously is a severe issue and it's a byproduct of an allergy not directly associated with the venom. Uh, but if a number of these specimens, uh, they say if you get more than 20 stings from the, uh, these types of hornets, you should seek medical attention because the venom itself then can cause issues. Uh, um, it can cause uh, sometimes organ failures, uh, direct toxicity, and they even have a little bit of hemorrhagic and, uh, and uh, necrotic um, components to the toxins, which can actually cause blisters and um, um, uh, basically sting sites where the, the skin begins to kind of uh, deteriorate. So, but one individual sting is not going to be an issue with these wasps. It's not like they sting you and you're immediately dead. These are not really as dangerous as any other wasps around uh, here in North Carolina. Okay, now why are we talking about it? Uh, well, Asian giant hornet has never been in, the, in North America or the Western Hemisphere until last year. Uh, in mid-August of 2019, they found some specimens uh, in British Columbia, Canada. Uh, some beekeepers found some specimens in Washington. They actually found a nest in uh, British Columbia, uh, which they eradicated. But what they're worried about now is that uh, queens had been produced and had started to create new nests. And in fact, after this was all published, they found a few more specimens this year, uh, just a few weeks ago. And so they're tracking these wasps, following back to potential nests and looking to eradicate them. Uh, but again, they're only found in the Pacific Northwest uh, and they have not been found anywhere else in North America. So basically there is a 0% chance, you know, basically a 0% chance that you will ever see uh, one in North Carolina, uh, at least for the time being. Um, and just to show you that, here are a bunch of uh, wasps who were submitted to Washington State. Uh, all the orange dots are just uh, ones that were submitted but were not. Asian giant hornets, the red ones are the, where the actual Asian giant hornets were from. And again, to give you a perspective, obviously we are here. They a very few limited number of specimens are over here. So really what it boils down to is hopefully the folks in Canada and Washington state can fully eradicate this uh, species from the area. If that happens, it's very unlikely to be established again unless somebody brings it in, something happens. Uh, but really, if, uh, if they're successful, we won't ever really hear about it uh, again. If they're unsuccessful and the hornet begins to spread, we'll be on top of it. And really, there are a lot of barriers. First of all, how far they fly, how quickly they colonize areas. It may take many, many years if they were to establish to get to North Carolina, if at all. In fact, the Rockies may be a big limiting factor because, for instance, the European hornet that's been here almost 200 years does not go west of the Rockies and is not found on the west coast. So there are barriers. So again, we really will probably never see it in North Carolina. And even if it did establish, it would take many, many years and we would keep you up to date on what's going on locally. Now, then you might ask, well, how did it get here? Well, nobody really knows. Uh, that's the unfortunate thing about invasive species is that it's very difficult sometimes to pinpoint how it got here. 
So typically invasive species are accidentally brought in through human activities. For instance, a queen could have started, it came from Asia to the US or to, to Canada, and then basically uh, flew out, found a new home and started to make a colony. Um, the other thing is that it could have intentionally been brought in. It's probably not likely, but it's not impossible. People bring things into other areas intentionally uh, for some reason, not thinking about them establishing. But actually in Asia, they are used for food and drinks. Uh, so the larvae and the pupae, which are very large, are used in some dishes in Asia. And so there is always the possibility that somebody wanted them here. Uh, this is not Un, uh, this is not impossible. In fact, for instance, the gypsy moth was brought to the U.S. a long, long time ago because they wanted to produce better silk than silkworms, and it got out and basically became a huge pest. This does happen every once in a while, so it's not impossible, but it's more likely that it was accidentally brought in um, just through commerce and travel. Now, as far as if it were to establish here in North America, what would happen with the bee, with the honeybee industry, with bee killings here? Uh, basically, would our bees be completely destroyed? And the answer is really no. Um, you know, only certain times a year do these wasps, these hornets do this uh, mass killing of bees. And we do have cultural control, these, these uh, physical barriers that you can add to uh, beehives, they actually do this already because other bees will try to steal honey from other beehives. So in this case, these types of uh, physical barriers would keep the hornets from being able to enter a hive and destroy it. Uh, so we do have some non-chemical and some ways to prevent wasps, these hornets, from, from uh, destroying beehives here in the U.S. as well. But again, that's all moot because we really don't foresee it being established anytime soon and even getting to North Carolina anytime soon. Okay, so the last part of the talk, I just wanna show you some common lookalikes. We do have several types of wasps and other insects in the state that look similar, uh, perhaps to an untrained eye, to uh, Asian giant hornets. So I do get a lot of uh, requests for identifications. In fact, over the last uh, month and a half, I've gotten almost 180 requests, and none of them have been Asian giant hornets, and 80%, over 80%, close to 90% of them have been the European hornet. Now, if you're seeing these two pictures, you've probably seen them, you've seen them already in the presentation, but uh, over here is the Asian giant hornet, and over here is the European hornet. Now, there's a reason they look so similar. It's because they're both in the genus Vespa. They're both close relatives. Um, and so it's, it can, they can look superficially similar. Uh, and like I said, the European hornet has been in the U.S. in our, in our state for over 150 years, 180 years. Um, but the major differences are the ones I pointed out a little bit before, but here specifically, the European hornet has reddish brown color on the back of its head, on its thorax, and in the front of its abdomen, whereas the Asian giant hornet has a completely yellow head, um, at least here in the US. Um, it, the, some European hornets in the old world still have a bit of a yellow head. But another thing you can look at is the eyes. The eyes of the Asian giant hornet are much smaller than the cheeks, whereas in the European hornet, they're very large. They're about the size of the cheek width. And lastly, the stripes on the abdomen of the European hornet have these little teardrop or little dot uh, markings on each stripe, whereas in the Asian giant hornet, the stripes are very even across. So this is the most commonly uh, misidentified wasp for Asian giant hornet. Now, another one that's uh, been misidentified, this is about 10 or 15% of the submissions I get, is the Southern Yellow Jacket, and especially Queen Southern Yellow Jackets. Uh, now, what I'm showing you here is not uh, true to size. I'll show you that in a second. But the way you can distinguish Southern Yellow Jackets, especially the Queens in the spring, uh, which can be fairly large for a Yellow Jacket, um, they have two yellow stripes down the thorax which no other yellow jacket around here has. 
They also, the queens, have very uh, limited markings on their abdomen. The abdomen is basically all orange with a few random black markings. Um, they are much smaller than Asian giant hornets. In fact, this is the size comparison. When you put them side by side, uh, they are larger than a typical yellow jacket, but they are much smaller than Asian giant hornets. Uh, very soon, we're going to start seeing cicada killers. Uh, these are very large wasps, in fact, a, sometimes a bit bigger than Asian giant hornet. And uh, they only come out in certain times of the year uh, when their host is out. So they are specifically preying on cicadas, which, because they're hunting wasps, they go and hunt individual cicadas, sting it, paralyze it, and bury it in the ground for their young to feed on. Uh, because they're, they're hunting cicadas, they are very large insects, uh, easily two inches long. Um, so size isn't really going to matter much for, the, for distinguishing this species from uh, Asian giant hornets. Uh, but uh, the best uh, differences are the, this long pointed black abdomen with a few pale yellow or yellow uh, splotches. They also have a smallish head compared to the abdomen and the body, very large eyes with no notch in the eyes. So those are the best ways to tell it from Asian giant hornet. Now, soon enough, uh, end of June, uh, early July, when the cicadas start coming out, you start hearing them in the summer, you may start to see these big wasps swarming around uh, ground that is uh, free of a lot of vegetation. This is, they often nest communally, and uh, although it's not a colony, so they won't defend it and they're not aggressive, uh, but they will find a patch of ground that they find suitable. They'll start digging holes and tunnels and the females will then bury those cicadas. Now, the first ones to come out are gonna be the males and male wasps cannot sting. Remember I said that the stinger is the modified egg laying device. That means no male wasps can sting at all, but some male wasps will be territorial and will look aggressive because they're trying to defend the site where they want their mates to, to dig holes. And so they can swarm or, uh, you know, get in your face, but they can't actually sting. And the females are not aggressive and won't do that at all. So basically, these are harmless wasps. I've even heard that even if they were to sting, which is very, very rare, you'd have to grab one uh, to do that that's a very slight sting, probably less painful than a bee sting. Anyway, these are very interesting, large native wasps that uh, should be respected and not killed. Uh, and like I said, you will see them fairly soon uh, coming out. Another hunting wasp uh, that can be fairly large, you can see it here next to the Asian giant hornet, is the great golden digger wasp. These are large hunting wasps that hunt katydids instead of cicadas for their prey. Uh, and they do also bury it in the ground. Uh, the two ways to distinguish them from Asian giant hornets, again, they have a, a smaller head with bigger eyes. They have this very, very thin wasp waist and these very golden hairs all over the head and the thorax. Uh, although they can sting, they are not aggressive. Again, they're a solitary wasp. They are not defending a colony. So they, they're typically going to be out on flowers or looking for prey for their young. And actually these two, the great golden digger wasp and the cicada killer are closely related to mud daubers uh, and mud wasps that, uh, that hunt prey as well. There are a couple of sawflies. I mentioned these earlier. These are primitive type wasps that feed on plants. The elm sawfly is a very large insect. It's a, almost as large as one of the giant hornets. Uh, here's a female and here's a male. And basically uh, they are uh, their larvae are like caterpillars that feed on leaves of trees. Um, they have clubbed antennae and a very thick attachment between their abdomen and their thorax. Most other, all the stinging wasps out there have a very thin wasp waist, whereas these have a very strong connection between there. They also have a completely black head um, in the elm sawflies. Now pigeon horntails are another type of sawfly technically, but their larvae live in uh, bore into dead trees where they feed on the wood. Uh, they are very large. They can actually be a little bit larger, at least longer than uh, an Asian giant hornet. Um, but again, they're, 
they're very long and cigar shaped. They've got this thick attachment between the thorax and the abdomen. Um, and also in this group, uh, it's hard to see here, they have a little tiny spine at the tip of their abdomen and the females have an ovipositive. It looks like a stinger, but is not a stinger. Um, so again, these large sawfly type wasps cannot sting. Uh, they maybe lo look large and scary, but they're completely harmless. Uh, there are also a few true flies. Uh, these aren't wasps or even in the order Hymenoptera. They're actually in this order Diptera. Uh, but many of them mimic wasps because, of course, a lot of things are afraid of wasps because they sting or they will avoid them. Uh, the most common are going to be several types of hoverflies that look a lot like bees and some robber flies, which are a predatory type fly. Uh, the best way to tell flies from wasps it's hard to tell here because the wings are folded, but flies only ever have two true wings. Uh, wasps will have four. Uh, it's hard to see here, but there's, you can see the base of one here and the base of another here. Uh, but wasps do uh, connect their wings in flight, so it's a little difficult to tell sometimes. But a little bit easier is the eyes are very large in flies and their antennae are very small. Wasps have very long antennae, uh, whereas flies typically have very short antennae. Now they cannot sting, but robber flies like these two, if grabbed, can bite. They actually are predators, they can actually hunt wasps, uh, and they have a venomous bite. But uh, again, if you're not touching them, you're just looking at them, they are not aggressive, they are not going to sting or anything like that. Okay, so that basically wraps up information on wasps and Asian giant hornets. Uh, so in the end, basically the chances of you seeing any one anytime soon, if ever at all, is basically zero. Um, again, keep it out, keep your ears out, uh, ears open and eyes out for um, news about them invading North Carolina, but we will be the first to let you know. So again, if the efforts in the Pacific Northwest aren't successful, entomologists will be updating and informing the public about the range expansion and the movement of these wasps. And you will know uh, as soon, we will let everybody know as soon as we find out, if we find out that they are in North Carolina. But for now, we don't expect them to be in the state uh, ever or anytime soon. Uh, definitely keep an eye out, recognize your native wasps and how they differ from Asian giant hornet, but don't go just killing wasps and lookalikes because uh, you're afraid that it's an Asian giant hornet. Be informed, try and capture the wasp alive. You can always email me or contact me with photos uh, to take a look and verify what it is, but know that uh, basically there's no chance of you seeing one anytime soon, if at all. Um, and just take a deep breath and enjoy nature. Uh, murder hornet is a, is a crazy uh, pairing of words and it did scare a lot of people, but really uh, they, they're not a big issue. They're not going to be a big issue, hopefully. And even if they were established here, they, we do have hornets that are just as large and you know, gonna act in a similar way. So really, Right now, the best thing to do is inform yourself and uh, just relax until you hear otherwise. And with that, I will uh, take any questions. We do have one question. Um, I've got a neighbor who is a honey beekeeper with 11 hives. I see his bees on my native pollinator plants often. I've been wondering if high populations of European honeybees in the area, in an area out compete the native pollinators, hoping the natives and non-natives can peacefully coexist. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, so I'm not a bee expert. Um, I don't know exactly, but uh, basically the best thing you can do is plant a lot of native plants. Uh, some, some bees or some plants won't be pollinated by honeybees or uh, by native bees and vice versa. So basically, um, if you keep an eye on your plants, take a look for, uh, for insects that are not honeybees. 
Uh, there are a lot of other pollinators, even not just bees. There are flies and beetles and lots of different types of insects that are actually pollinators. Um, and the bees, our native bees, come in all different shapes and sizes. So some are very small, uh, much smaller than a honeybee, can basically uh, fit on the leg of a honeybee. So if you're worried, just uh, go out and observe. I will tell you that uh, lots of huge wasps, some that may seem dangerous and can actually sting, uh, when they're at plants with flowers, they're very preoccupied with that. And so you can sit there safely and watch them and not worry about them stinging or anything like that. So just uh, going out and being observers yourselves can be very important and uh, get you in contact with nature. And basically just take a look. Um, if you don't see any bees other than honeybees coming to a plant, it may be that they're just not as attractive to the native bees. Okay, we have another question. Do hornets or wasps die after they sting? That's a great question. Uh, so they don't actually die uh, after they sting. Uh, they, uh, I think there are a few in the world that do, but in general, what happens is that the hornet stingers, the stinger of a hornet actually you can see here is not barbed. So it doesn't have little hooks on it. And so they can sting multiple times. Uh, that is one of the dangers of hornets. Uh, bees, honeybees especially, on the other hand, uh, they have this uh, these barbed stinger, and what happens is that when the bee pulls it out, uh, the venom sac is still attached to the stinger in the skin and keep pump keeps pumping venom into the into the uh, the attacker, and then the bee will die. So that is true about bees. And um, I'm not sure why they have that, but it's just probably a way to uh, better defend their colonies. And because they have so many members in a hive, uh, that they are going to be a little bit more willing to defend because they can lose a few workers without actually causing harm to the entire hive. So that's kind of a general rule of thumb. If, if the bigger the colony a wasp has, a hornet or yellow jacket has, the more aggressive they will be defending it. Uh, whereas again, paper wasps, because they don't have many members in their colony, are typically not as aggressive as uh, yellow jackets and hornets. Okay. So do we have any more questions for Dr. Bertine? Okay. Oops. So what I'm going to do, I'm gonna um, place a poll launch a poll if um, our visitors to our attendees today they if they do not mind answering that poll we'll give it a um, few minutes to do to um, for everybody to provide answers and um, actually I don't know about the rest of our attendees today but I found the topic very interesting um, I have learned a lot, and again, we would like to thank Dr. Ratone for joining us today all the way from Raleigh. We hope that everyone stays safe, and um, we will have another History for Lunch, which will be scheduled for Wednesday, July the 1st at noon, and we're going to have Dr. Bowman from Elizabeth City. He's going to speak on um, making history at the lunch counter, the 1960 civil rights demonstrations in downtown Elizabeth City. So you can join us Wednesday, July the 1st at noon. And also too, we have recorded our topic today. So if you happen to miss something, we will, the museum will be posting to our, um, oops, I'm sorry. As I say, we are still learning around here. But the museum will be posting Dr. Bertone's um, History for Lunch today to our YouTube account. So look, go to our museum website and you can find our YouTube link and we will get it posted as soon as possible. But again, thank you for joining us all the way from Raleigh today. We greatly appreciate your time. No problem. Thanks for inviting me and, uh, and it was fun. And hopefully everyone learned something and and enjoyed it. I think they, I, I know I learned, so I'm pretty sure everyone else did too. Great. Thank All right. you. And stay safe. Thank you. You too. Everyone else too.